Welcome to this service of commissioning and ordination. It's a high and holy moment uh, during annual conference. It's a time that uh, memories are created. Uh, to, uh, tonight, I'm wearing a stole that was passed down to me by Dr. Leighton Farrell, who was my mentor and my friend. It was Dr. Farrell who stood with me when I was ordained at Lover's Lane United Methodist Church uh, by Bishop McFerrin Stowe. This is a time of memories. It's a time, a very meaningful time. I ask um, Reverend Kim Myers, who is the family ministry's pastor at St. Andrew, what ordination means to her. And she said it's an ending and a beginning. It's ending a rigorous time of preparation uh, that uh, helped her to grow in her faith. It's the beginning of a lifelong time of learning and ministry, building the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. So St. Andrew is honored to host this worship service this evening. And know that those of you who are online, uh, during the processional hymn, you will see the words to, those, to that hymn uh, on the screen and you are welcome to sing uh, and join in this celebration by singing. Those of you who are here in the sanctuary, we ask that you join during the processional hymn uh, through prayer, prayer of thanksgiving for those being commissioned and those being ordained. So let us worship God.
I'm glad you're here tonight. If you are with us virtually or if you're here at St. Andrew, we'd like to invite you to join us in the call to worship. It's at the bottom of your screen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. The Holy Spirit is among us. Move us, Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Eternal God, by Jesus, by Jesus Christ, Christ and the Holy Spirit, Spirit you gave to your apostles and all your church many excellent gifts. Come upon us gathered here to set apart those who will lead among us by calling and equipping us to fulfill your desire that we do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Who presents these candidates to be ordained, commissioned, or recognized this evening? We have recommended them in our congregations. We present them with our prayers and support. We, the members of the Board of Ordained Ministry, we have examined these candidates according to the standards of our discipline in this annual conference of the United Methodist Church. We present them with our prayers and our support. We present these persons for ordination as elder. We present them with our prayers and support. Tamara Lynn Galloway. Christopher Ross O'Reilly. Bryant Xavier Phelps. Ashley Ann Seip. Sylvia Sheehan Wang. We present these persons for ordination as deacon. We present them with our prayers and our support. Jennifer Diane Chickering, Sarah Ann Marcellus Luganbill, Gary Boyd Stevens, Kathy Renee Sweeney, Kimberly Rankin Myers, We present these persons for commissioning as provisional members. We present them with our prayers and support. Flor Granillo, Danielle Boonwan Kim, Macy Alexandria Liptoy, Carrie Lynn Lucas, Peter Hire McNabb, Nicholas Jerome McRae, Kenneth Kyung Wong Park, Chelsea Patricia Petticord, Katrina Marie Culberson Smith. And we also present Richard Samuel Williamson for recognition of the orders of the United Methodist Church. We present him with our prayers and support. We the Spirit's work in our lives and the lives of those who come to serve and to lead among us. We will uphold them with our prayers and support. Thanks be to God. As the candidates who are being commissioned and ordained, I ask you these questions. My sisters and brothers in Christ, as commissioned or ordained ministers, you are to be co-workers with bishops, elders, deacons, local pastors, provisional members, diaconal ministers, deaconesses, home missioners, supply pastor, and all of the people of God. 
You're called to serve rather than to be served, to proclaim the faith of the church and no other, and to look after the concerns of God's kingdom above all. So we may know that you believe yourselves to be called by God and that you profess the Christian faith we ask you. Do you believe God has called you? Excuse me. Do you believe God has called you to the life and work of set apart ministry? Do you believe in the triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? Are you persuaded that the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments contain all things necessary for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ and are the unique and authoritative standard for the church's faith and life? Will you be faithful in prayer, in the study of the Holy Scriptures, and with the help of the Holy Spirit continually rekindle the gift of God that is in you? Will you do your best to pattern your life in accordance with the teachings of Christ? Will you, in the exercise of your ministry, lead the people of God to faith in Jesus Christ, participate in the life and work of the community, and seek peace, justice, and freedom for all people? Will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church, accepting and upholding its order, its liturgy, doctrine, and discipline? defending them against all doctrines contrary to God's holy word and committing yourself to be accountable with those serving with you and to the bishop and those who are appointed to supervise your ministry. Will you, for the sake of the church's life and mission, covenant to participate in the life of the order into which you are ordained, commissioned, received, or recognized? Will you give yourself to God through the order in order to sustain and build each other up in prayer, study, worship, and service under the rule of life set forth in the vows you take this day? May God, who has given you the will to do these things, give you grace to perform them, that the work begun in you by the Holy Spirit may may be brought to, to you in perfection. The ordinance, please be seated. Christ gave all of us this command, 
Ask the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the vineyards, into, the, into his harvest. We have asked and the Lord has answered. These sisters and brothers know our Savior's concern for God's people. See the plentiful harvest and are ready to respond generously to the Lord in the words of the prophet. Here I am, send me. Urged on by the love of Christ and strengthened by the Holy Spirit, they come now to declare in public their desire to live out the covenant made at their baptism by binding themselves to the service of God under the supervision of the bishop and the guidance of colleagues in full connection and by being appointed to serve as servant leaders in the body of Christ. Today we commission them to serve us as they continue to prepare for ordained ministry among us. God of the apostles and the prophets, of the martyrs and the teachers, you raise up men and women to be apostolic leaders in your church, and by your Holy Spirit help these your servants to understand and live the mystery of your love with boldness and joy. Deepen their sense of purpose as they exercise commissioned ministry. Empower them and those who will walk with them to guide their ministry together with all of your people. To heal the sick, love the outcast, resist evil, preach the word, and give themselves freely for your name's sake. Amen. Let us pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon Chelsea Patricia Petticord. Send her now to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to announce the reign of God, and to equip the church for ministry. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon Katrina Marie Culberson Smith. Send her now to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to announce the reign of God, and to equip the church for ministry in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon Flor Granillo. Send her now to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to announce the reign of God, and to equip the church for ministry. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon Danielle Buwan Kim. Send her now to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to announce the reign of God, and to equip the church for ministry in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit on Macy Alexandria Liptoy. Send her now to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to announce the reign of God, and to equip the church for ministry in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon Carrie Lynn Lucas. Send her now to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to announce the reign of God, and to equip the church for ministry. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon Peter Heyer McNabb. Send him now to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to announce the reign of God and to equip the church for ministry. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon Nicholas Jerome McRae. Send him now to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to announce the reign of God, and to equip the church for ministry. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pour out your Holy Spirit 
upon Kenneth Yongwan Park. Send him now to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to announce the reign of God, and to equip the church for ministry. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Will the commissioned candidates turn and face the congregation, both virtually and those who are present? Let us greet these newly commissioned members of the church.
The scripture for this evening is found in the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verse 1 through 6, and it reads in the following manner. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So in a Zoom call a few weeks ago, or perhaps a few months ago, with the ordinance and those who are to be commissioned this evening, I shared with you that probably this was not my dream for you the way this would happen tonight. I have to admit that. You too may have had some disappointment, but let's be honest. Even this evening, as we are gathered here for worship and for commissioning and ordination of you, I can assure you that there is a larger crowd gathered here tonight than there are a lot of places, even annual conferences around our country or certainly around the world. I can assure you that this is a special night still. And as I said that time when we were visiting on Zoom, which you may or may not remember, because I can assure you that if you're anything like me, you are Zoomed out. (laughs) I don't mean zoned out, but Zoomed out. And I can assure you that I have frequent flyer status on Zoom. I am now executive platinum on Zoom. (laughs) And so are many of you. But this is still a special night. I remember the first time I read or I preached from this text. It was just a few years ago, but I'd been assigned the text when I was a student at Perkins School of Theology for homiletics with Dr. Ron Sleeve. Uh, There were 12 students in the class Uh, Most of them were smarter than I was, and when I began to listen to sermons that every preached the first time, I knew that they were, and I can remember especially a sermon from a female classmate who I remind her every time I see her that is still one of the better sermons I've ever heard in my whole life, and it was a sermon on the ascension of Jesus. It was very timely, and because she sort of intersected a a movie that was very popular and that many of us had seen, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Now, I can, I can assure you that probably some of you don't know that movie, or even if you do, you're wondering, what does that have to do with anything related to the ascension of Jesus? I couldn't tell you today, but she did a really good job. <laughs> I do know it still is one of the best sermons I've ever heard in my whole life, and I was assigned this text that was read just a few moments ago, The Call of Moses, and it, I followed her that day. Whoa. I was scared before I got to class. I was scared when I walked through the door of Perkins Chapel. I was scared when I sat down and when she finished the sermon, I was trembling. How could I match that? You have to admit most of us who are clergy are perfectionists. It's not that we're in competition with each other. We just want to do that which is our very best. I really don't remember much about that sermon that I preached. I know there were 12 
colleagues, peers in the, in the chapel at Perkins that day, and the preaching professor, who later, two weeks later, was the, was the preacher for the annual conference in which I was a member, the Central Texas Conference. In fact, I remember going to lunch with him because Dr. Walter Underwood, a first time at this church at Fort Worth where I was beginning a role as an intern from Perkins School of Theology for a year, he said, I want you to go to lunch with Dr. Sleeth and me. And I was like thrilled. And on the way to lunch, Dr. Sleeth said, Mike, what did you make in my preaching class? I got to tell you, I wish he'd ask me anything, but to ask the person who I was going to work for what I made, I said, well, Dr. Sleeth, you get... I, you gave me a B. He said, Mike, you earned a B. <laughs> but I want to tell you, you are better than a B. I was anxious that day. I was anxious that day. My plan for God's call on my life really was not to preach every Sunday. I never began work at my work at Perkins thinking or in answering my call to ordain ministry that every Sunday I would preach from pulpits across the Central Texas Conference. I had other things in mind for what ministry looked like for me, what vocation looked like for me, what I knew God was calling me to do and to be. To be ordained an elder was important and I would not have taken a preaching class except that it was a requirement for those who wanted to be ordained. And it was before the order of deacon was a permanent order that I'd already been ordained a deacon before I could be ordained an elder. Every time I read this story of Moses and his call from God, I come to this text with a great deal of curiosity and I leave very puzzled. Some of my life of faith is much like that. I come with a great deal of curiosity trying to determine what it is God is asking of me and you probably do similar things and trying to figure out and when you begin to ask those questions and do all the work in terms of you read the Bible, you do prayer, you do discernment and then you leave more puzzled than you were when you began that conversation. But I know this, that if I were to give you any advice, which I now will, that any case study in leadership, ministry, vocation related to your call, I simply ask you to read the book of Exodus. Because that story of Moses that just be, really begins here with that call, there are some other things that happen in the first two chapters of the book of Exodus. I hope and pray that you know that. <laughs> are very important. He fled for his life because he had killed an Egyptian, although he had been raised by Pharaoh's daughter. He tended the sheep of a man who would become his father-in-law. He had so many interesting experiences in this book of Exodus that he was a well-traveled man by the time of his death, years and years later. But at this moment, he was hiding for his own safety. And who would know his name? Moses, Moses. Who would call it? And then looking around, he sees something strange that defies any kind of explanation whatsoever. And remember the person or the voice who called his name is the same voice that answered him when he asked, who are you? What is your name? And that voice answered, I am who I am. God is puzzling. That's not much of an answer of certainty. I am who I am. So the challenges that Moses faced in his own calling of what it meant to follow or to, uh, to say yes to this vocation, for him to say, here am I. Remember, he stuttered, so his brother Aaron spoke for him. And perhaps some of you have brothers who wish to speak for you. He had no idea what would happen over the next several years. He had no idea what the escape or the exodus from Egypt would be. He had no idea that the parting of the waters would happen because of the way he raised his hand. He didn't know that there would be hunger and thirst so that the Back to Egypt committee that had gathered around him that he had led out of Egypt said, at least we had enough to eat and to drink. Let's go back. 
He takes a stick, he strikes the rock, water comes forth, manna rains down from heaven and it happens over and over and over again. And then Moses goes up to the mountain and he gets the Ten Commandments after a period of time. He hides from God. There's just this ongoing history. Isn't ministry exciting for Moses? Don't you hope it's exciting for you? 40 years of wandering because that same back to Egypt committee I, they're the same people everywhere you go <laughs> every church you go uh, they're an unruly bunch but this one made it a golden calf and it well they paid for it everybody paid for it 40 years of wandering you know my own curiosity is where did they wander around how could you not find a better place than the wilderness for 40 years looking for the promised land? He did not know that saying here I am would be this hard. And I want to disabuse you of any notions you may have. Ministry can be challenging and difficult. Ministry is a joy. Most of the days of my life, I need to tell you, not all, but most of the days of my life in ministry, I have found them to be very joyful even during difficult times. Some of the experiences I've had in ministry have really been things I cannot describe. It's not as if they're that confusing. It is those times in which you are allowed into a family's life whom you know as people who attend your church but you don't know well. And you get that call, and they open the door of their lives and their soul to you, and you learn things about them, and you think, I am a privileged human being that people trust me this much. And they shared this with me. And then you learn, you hold it tightly. And while you're not certain every day about what ministry looks like for you, you're clear on that day that there is a purpose for your saying yes. When I think about Moses, just think about the resilience he must have had. I can't imagine what it would have been like, what would it be like to lead a group of people who really were unsure about what they were going to do or where they were going to go or what the purpose is, but he kept telling them, I would be really confused by that. And I, I, I don't know that I'd follow somebody who'd be leading me through the wilderness for 40 years. I mean, I have to admit, I'm, I like creature comforts. And I don't think there are many creature comforts there in the wilderness, but I must tell you there are times that there's nothing comfortable that will happen in your life but if you have resilience on this journey I promise you that that our God and God's call upon your life will lead you to places you never imagined you would be going tonight we could talk about holy ground I mean that's what it said in the text in holy ground look this is a beautiful sanctuary I think it's a very beautiful sanctuary I like preaching in this place I like gathering this place I like worshiping in this place there's so much good about this place some of the music tonight you can tell but to be honest it's not the place really that's the building that's holy it's what God does in this building with everyone it's not that tonight that where this is, you're standing on holy ground, it is that you participate with God in a very holy experience. When I place my hands upon your head, those of you who are going to be ordained, and I say those words, take thou authority. And I promise you are in for holy moments. Not just tonight, but for 30, 40, 50 years. And you know why those moments are going to happen to you and with you? Because you just said, yes. Here am 
I. Remember some of the holy moments in my life. Again, I wouldn't share a lot of them with you because I think they're confidential, but I remember those public holy moments. I can remember in the sanctuary the first time I met this church of Fort Worth when Bishop McFerrin Stowe placed his hands upon my head and ordained me as a deacon. That was before there was a permanent icon. A few years later, Bishop Stowe, along with several elders of my own choosing and every cabinet member of uh, the Central Texas Conference placed their hands upon me and I thought, would you, some of you take your hands off me because it feels real heavy. <laughs> I don't think about either of those churches as being sacred places. I remember them as good times, I, but I remember those experiences. And I remember perhaps even more importantly, two years after I was ordained an elder, a year before I was to go to my first appointment in which I was going to have to preach every Sunday, that to which I never intended to do. I was sitting in the balcony the first time I met this church. Fred Craddock was preaching. Some of you know who Fred Craddock was, one of the best preachers of all time. And he simply said in those who were being ordained, but he was saying it to me, remember that what you're called to do is infinitely more important than how you may feel about it on any given day. There are days you may want to quit. Call your district superintendent. Share with him what's troubling you or her. There are days that you may want to think, I want to go to that church. Don't ask. (laughs) We are caught up on people who want to make their own appointments. I just want you to know that. I'm all caught up on it. But what I want to say to you is that somehow I don't understand the itinerancy. I just know that I've been a part of it a party I went to one place that I wanted to go so much it's one of those places I did tell the bishop I really wanted to go he didn't do me any favors it was a challenge and then I went to a place that I didn't want to go and it was the longest pastor of my life and the most fulfilling itinerancy works for me I have to tell you this, as my life has unfolded and I did not intend to preach every Sunday, I had other plans for my life and ministry, and as it unfolded, I realized that I was always looking for something that was certain, and I never got it. But I got clarity about God's call on my life. I got to tell you, I never planned to be a bishop. And there are probably a lot of people who didn't plan for me to be one either. (laughs) And, you know, I think they can just get over it, you know. (laughs) And what I'm saying about that really is, is that we really do not know where ministry is going to take us. But I can promise you this. I know that I can promise you this because I've seen it lived out in my own life and the lives of many people in this room who I call friends and have for several decades. I know this, that you will have so many holy, moving experiences, you will realize you're in the presence of the holy. And the only way you may have to talk about it to somebody is, this was just holy ground. That's what I want this to be for you tonight. I want to tell you something else. Remember how anxious and frightened I was of that sermon I was going to preach at Perkins Chapel, the first sermon in homiletics? I don't know if you had those experiences or not, but I did. I still get anxious every time I stand before a congregation. I get real anxious. I get not frightened, not that I'm ill-prepared, it's just I get anxious. And I've never known why. After 38 years of preaching, every Sunday until I became a bishop, I still get anxious. I've decided if I'm not as confident as I act like I am, that's okay. That may mean that I'm really wrestling with truth but one thing I am confident in or of 
that somehow I'm not responsible really in the end for what you do with what I say. I'm only responsible to witness to our God in Christ as best as I can. So if there are those times in which you are anxious about either preaching, teaching, or very faithful, holy work, this is one thing that I'm clear about. Whether you know it or not, our God will be with you. You are standing in a holy time for you tonight. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. God of creation, maker of all things, we gather in this place to pray. We do invite you, come now among us, come and build your church today.
I come in from a different tradition. And so what really attracted me to United Methodism is the focus on communion and real presence, and then the aspects of grace that are the hallmark of the United Methodist Church. So theology really brought me in and gets me excited as we continue on as a United Methodist. Yeah, you know, I came from a tradition that went through a difficult time and now here I am again with United Methodist. So it's an interesting time, but my hope is that in our struggle with our culture and our world difficulty right now, is that we find a way that we can unify around the grace of God that comes in the good news of Jesus Christ. So that we really can transform our community our culture, and our world. And that really is my hope for United Methodist. Just starting a new church in a pandemic with a crisis going around the world and economic unrest in the United States. Right now, it's just trying to help the church to settle down and take a breath and move through these times so that in the next six to eight months as we dialogue with me being a new pastor for them and them being in their context, that we figure out a way that we can find new ministries that can truly penetrate the community in different ways that may really help the growth of the community of Christ. After due examination of your call and ministry in another part of Christ's Holy Church, we now welcome you to this communion. You have given your assurance of your faith and Christian experience. You've renewed the vows of your ordination, embraced our own, committing yourself to accept and uphold faithfully the doctrine, liturgy, and discipline of the United Methodist Church. We rejoice that you have been called to serve among us and pray that God may guide your ministry. Richard Samuel Williamson, we now recognize you as an elder in the United Methodist Church. Will you turn and uh, take off your mask and will you face the crowd? They're here. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. We're glad you're here with us. A deacon is called to share in Christ's ministry of servanthood, to, rate, to relate the life of the community to its service in the world, to lead others into Christian discipleship, to teach and to lead others into Christian discipleship, to nurture disciples for witness and service, to lead in worship, to teach and proclaim God's word, to assist elders and appointed local pastors at Holy Baptism and Holy Communion, to interpret to the church the world's hurts and hopes, to serve all people, particularly the poor, the sick, and the oppressed, and to lead Christ's people in ministries of compassion and justice, liberation and reconciliation, 
especially in the face of hardship and personal sacrifice. This is the rule of life and work of a deacon. Do you believe that God has called you to life and work of a deacon? As these persons are recognized or ordained by God in the church for the ministry of deacons, to which we believe they have been called by the Holy Spirit, let us pray for them. Let us pray. We thank you, living God, that in your great love you sent Jesus the Christ to take the form of his servant, becoming obedient even to death on the cross, and now resurrected and exalted in the heavens. You have taught us by his word and example that whoever would be great among us must be servant of all. And give these servants grace to be faithful to their promises, constant in their discipleship and always ready for works of loving service. Make them modest and humble, gentle and strong, rooted and grounded in love, and give them a share in the ministry of Jesus Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve. I grew up going to a United Methodist Church, and I loved going to church because that was my church family. And as I got older, I realized that the United Methodist Church had this slogan, open hearts, open minds, and open doors. And that is what I first fell in love with being a United Methodist. Because for me, that embodies what John Wesley has to say about grace so completely, about how grace is offered to each and every one of us freely and without stipulation. And there's nothing we will do that can separate us from God's love. And for me, that's why I love being a United Methodist. I, my hope for the United Methodist Church is that it continues to listen to the Spirit, continues to listen where the Spirit is calling us to grow so we can continue to meet our neighbors wherever they may be and include all who are precious children of God. And my hope is that we continue to have this open hearts, minds, and spirit that I fell in love with. As a deacon in the United Methodist Church, one of my passions is to bring the church out into the world and the world back into the church. and. With our world today vastly different than it was a few months ago, we are seeing that there are creative and innovative ways that we can start bringing communities together. Um, one of the things I love about our church is the connectional aspect of it, and we can bridge youth groups across uh, different areas and geographical regions. So the youth in my rural community can start getting to know youth in a more urban community and vice versa. So one of the most creative ways I love doing that is to bring people together and that can be in the virtual space or in, um, you know, in physical space as well. Almighty God, pour upon Jennifer Diane Chickering the Holy Spirit for the office and work of a deacon in Christ's holy church. Jennifer Diane Chickering, take authority as a deacon to proclaim the word of God and to lead God's people in ministries of compassion and justice. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I love so many things about the United Methodist Church. I've been a United Methodist my entire life, but I think the reason that I choose to return to the United Methodist Church and I choose to serve the United Methodist Church is because of our response to God's grace and the, the expectation that is on our lives because of that. You know, paragraph 220 of the discipline um, spells it out clearly that as baptized people, we are to be the light and leaven of Christ in the world. We are supposed to um, help um, love other people. We are supposed to um, be Christ as we can. And that means in our homes with our families, in our day-to-day -day life, um, when we're going to the grocery store, when we're at home uh, and quarantined, we are supposed to, um, we, are, we get to respond to God's grace um, by striving for perfection. Last night I was on a Zoom call with my young adults 
And that's my hope. My hope is that the United Methodist Church lives into the best that we are. And when we do, we look like my young adult group. My young adult group comes from all different places in the United States, in the world. Um, we're all different cultures, all different skin colors. We are all different political ideas, but we still gather together. I'm finding that in the ministry that I thought I was called to, it's constantly changing. And as I look back on, on my life, um, it has been such that I was called to this place and time in this season, and then that has changed a little bit. And ordination for me um, speaks to who I am and who I'm truly called to be. Let us pray. Almighty God, pour upon Sarah Ann Marcellus Luganville the Holy Spirit for the awesome work of a deacon in Christ's holy church. Amen. Sarah Ann Marcellus Luganville, take authority as a deacon to proclaim the word of God and to lead God's people in ministries of compassion and justice. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, there's several things I like about the United Methodist Church. Uh, first, I think we have really good theology. I think we care about the Word, we study the Word, and, and uh, we apply the Word as best we can. So to me, the, the fact that we're really strong in our, in our Bible theology, I, I think is very important to me. My hopes and dreams uh, for United Methodist Church right now probably are, um, first, uh, that we get over our fear. Um, I think fear is causing us to direct too much of our best energy uh, away from the gospel into protecting the institutions that we all cherish and are important, uh, but since we're so afraid, uh, we're not focusing on the things that make those institutions important, that, that being spreading the gospel. We're all wrestling right now, of course, with how do we even just connect with people that are difficult to connect to right now. Uh, for example, I, I have a challenge right now because one of my ministries, Community Night, um, I didn't have contact information for the people that typically came to that. And so I actually don't have any way to get in touch with them. And so I've been working with how do I, how do I figure out how to get in touch with people that know I'm probably out there. I know I'm trying to get in touch with them, but, but I can't. So I think part of it is uh, wrestling with that. How do we find them? Uh, and then uh, secondarily, it's helping people to get comfortable with reaching out when they can't go and knock on their neighbor's door, when they can't borrow a cup of sugar. Uh, and, and how do they be comfortable with uh, sharing their hearts on email or on text or on Twitter? And a lot of our younger people, I think, they've already got it. We, we really... Um, the main thing we need to do with younger people is support them and get out of their way. Uh, but with the older people, we need to help them figure out how to do that. Let us pray. Almighty God, pour upon Gary Boyd Stevens the Holy Spirit for the office and work of a deacon in Christ's holy church. Amen. Gary Boyd Stevens take authority as a deacon to proclaim the word of God and to lead God's people in ministries of compassion and justice. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Been a Methodist my whole life. 
which is kind of exciting, and we moved around a lot. So when I say I really appreciate the connection of the United Methodist Church, I really appreciate the connection of the United Methodist Church. When I run into people that I was in, um, that I was at camp with in Virginia, or I run into my youth minister from Colorado, or anyone else from Austin that I, that I when I was there, um, really, the connection is a is an important thing that we all know we're we're in this body of Christ together. Well, I think in general, um, it's to continue that we can continue to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Um, that has been our call uh, since even before we were born. Um, for so many decades and years and centuries, um, we've been uh, called to be disciples and to be leaders and to be leading uh, new disciples. Some of the things are the same and some of the things are different. We're still, as Scott uh, Gilliland would call it, the unicorn justices, justice unicorns that are, um, that are active in, the, or in the, the neighborhood, the community, the city of Richardson, DFW. But I know that there's also a lot of um, new uh, um, mission type in, uh, environments coming up. There's some significant increase in evictions and the working poor is having to deal with how they find childcare, how they, um, how they pay for childcare, how they, how they handle things like this. And all of this falls into uh, the role of a deacon to connect the church with the world. And so in finding a lot of this uh, partnership where we can expand um, reaching from the church into the world to help transform their lives, um, that's important to me into uh, the, the ministry, I think, of Arapaho. Let us pray. Kathy Renee Sweeney, God pour, upon the Holy, God pour upon you the Holy Spirit for the office and work of a deacon in Christ's holy church. Amen. Kathy Renee Sweeney, take authority as a deacon to proclaim the word of God and to lead God's people in ministries of compassion and justice. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The church has always been a part of my life and helped form who I am. But today, it's a different reason why I get up and go on Sunday mornings. It's a greater calling. Especially in this time of COVID, we're learning that church can look different, can feel different, and really it needs to. So how can we continue to do that? I think we have great opportunities to be able to keep being innovative and spontaneous and being able to pivot um, and follow God's call. Um, two things have happened during um, the past, well, really two years, but actually it's really jumped off in the past six months, which feels like two years, let's be real. Um, but we, I've started an online Bible study at night, and we have like 450 women who gather together every Wednesday night. Now, I wanna be honest, not all 450 women gather at Wednesday night at eight o'clock, but there's a connection there. There's um, threads for prayers. There's reaching out to each other. And people can go back and watch the Bible study at a later time. I never, ever, ever would have 450 people connected on a Wednesday night at eight o'clock if I were to do it in a building. Um, one of my cool stories from that, like I have a high school friend, really doesn't go to church anymore. She lives in New Mexico and she's become a huge part of this Bible study and reaches out almost every night. Um, my sister-in-law who doesn't go to church is a part of this Bible study. And then some of our, you know, faithful people every week at church that you would have seen normally are part of this Bible study. And I think that diversity and faith and life is, makes it fuller. Let us pray. 
Almighty God, pour upon Kimberly Rankin Myers the Holy Spirit for the office and work of a deacon in Christ's holy church. Amen. Kimberly Rankin Myers, take authority as a deacon to proclaim the word of God, to lead God's people in ministries of compassion and justice. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I present to you the newly ordained deacons of the North Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church. Will you greet them? Let us worship together in celebration of these new, newly ordained ministers as we're led by choir members from the churches of our ordination class are currently serving. An elder is called to share in the ministry of Christ and, the, and of the whole church, to preach and teach the word of God and faithfully administer the sacraments of holy baptism and holy communion. To lead the people of God in worship and prayer, to lead persons to faith in Jesus Christ, to exercise pastoral supervision and to order the life of the congregation and the connection, to counsel the troubled and declare the forgiveness of sins, to lead the people of God in obedience to Christ's mission in the world, to seek justice, peace, and freedom for all people, and to take a responsible place in the government of the church and in service in and to the community. This is the rule of life and work of an elder. Do you believe that God has called you to the life and work of an elder? As these persons are ordained or recognized by the church for the office and work of elders to which we believe they've been called by the Holy Spirit, let us now pray for them. Let us pray. We praise you, eternal God, because you have called us to be a priestly people offering to you acceptable worship through Jesus Christ, our Lord, apostle and high priest, shepherd and bishop of our souls. 
We thank you that by dying, Christ has overcome death and having ascended into heaven, has poured forth gifts abundantly on your people, making some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, and to equip the saints for the work of ministry, to build up Christ's body and to fulfill your gracious purpose in the world. Give to these, your servants, the grace and power they need to serve you in this ministry and make them faithful pastors, patient teachers, and wise counselors. Enable them to serve without reproach, to proclaim the gospel of salvation, to administer the sacraments of the new covenant, and to offer with all your people spiritual sacrifices acceptable to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Gosh, you know, I have to say that I was born and raised, baptized and raised in the United Methodist Church. It is my theological and spiritual home, and the people of the United Methodist Church are my family. Um, that's very different, I know, from some people that maybe have come to our denomination late. So it's just for me, I love it because it's it's what gave me, brought me to this place and uh, um, nurtured me. But really, um, one of the other things I love about our church is the way that our theology and practice are grounded together. Um, we teach people to really um, think. I, I think our denomination encourages uh, people to be open to a lot of different perspectives and seeing things in different ways. We are very rooted in scripture and tradition, but we're also taught to use our reason and to look for how the Holy Spirit is moving in our world today um, and our, our experience of where God is moving in our lives and calling us into new ways of being. So I would hope moving forward that we can really learn to have a spirit of sitting together and having holy conversations, really listening to people with open hearts and open minds, being willing to be transformed ourselves by the gifts and the perspectives that other people bring. And with that, I hope for this beautifully diverse church that we can have diverse colors of people, diverse um, thinking, diverse practices, diverse ways of being together, but still have a unity of spirit that embodies Christ's love for the world. Um, because that's really what's most important. Sometimes we focus on being bigger and better and more, but you know what? Sometimes we can do really th small things with great excellence and lots of love, as Mother Teresa would say. And I think that that is really the way of reaching more people is to unleash the laity of the United Methodist Church. They are our biggest asset. And I just wanna see the members of the churches I serve flourishing and living into the people God has created and gifted them to be so that they can create those new ministries for us. Almighty God, pour upon Tamara Lynn Galloway, the Holy Spirit, for the office and work of an elder in Christ's holy church. Amen. Tamara. Lynn Galloway, take authority as an elder to preach the word of God, to administer the holy sacraments and to order the life of the church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The way that we profess and live out our theology, right? I think a lot of people, um, when they look at the Methodist Church from the outside, um, most of the times, you know, they see these huge theological tents um, or churches, um, right? But they never really fully understand uh, the theology and how every Methodist um, and clergy person would live that out. And I would attribute that um, to grace and love. My hope leans on that we would be patient, right? Um, although we are eager um, for progress, although we are eager for a change, although we are eager um, um, for justice, um, that we would also uh, wait and be patient on the Lord. Um, so um, as being 
uh, and elder I am my upcoming ward nation um, I'm also stepping into a new role um, as a commissioned naval officer and a chaplain um, and one of uh, the things that we push in the chaplain corps is our four competencies right which is provide care facilitate and advise um, so a bulk of my work um, um, as a chaplain will be um, ministering and counseling uh, sailors and Marines and Coast Guard men and women um, um, to be able to live out whatever um, um, calling that they may have um, and to freely express um, um, whatever uh, religion um, that they would ascribe to, right? So just making sure uh, uh, that I am a willing vessel of the Lord um, and I'm there to provide the care and to advise um, those men and women of the armed forces. Let us pray. Almighty God, pour upon Christopher Ross O'Reilly, the Holy Spirit, for the office and work of the elder in Christ's holy church. Amen. Amen. Christopher Ross O'Reilly, take authority as an elder to preach the word of God and to administer the holy sacraments and to order the life of the church in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Great opportunity, uh, room for creativity, um, depth of knowledge. Uh, I enjoy, especially uh, in teaching and preaching, the opportunity to really turn text on their heads uh, and not get in trouble for it. <laughs> uh, so I enjoy the creativity and the depth of knowledge. I think it's a great uh, attribute that the church offers and provides, uh, especially in grace and in love. And so I appreciate it uh, and look forward to continuing my time in the United Methodist Church. My background has been in social organizing and movements, and my hope is that the church takes firmer stances on what it says it believes, uh, specifically right now to become an anti-racist church, uh, to hold that banner up, uh, and to be at the forefront of social movement ongoing. Uh, the civil rights movement would be nothing had it not been for United Methodist presence, specifically uh, with uh, characters like Reverend James Lawson. Uh, I think the church has an opportunity uh, to take a more forward stance, and my hope is that it becomes a more anti-racist and, and uh, proclaims itself to be such an anti-racist denomination. We've been thrusted into a new paradigm of ministry, and I wouldn't call it new so much. It's where we should have always been, uh, right? Um, it's so crazy that even during this time, our church, our local church, uh, as soon as this pandemic started, everything about our building started falling apart. Uh, and I, I wouldn't take that for granted, you know, I, I, and I don't think that it's coincidental either uh, that the building started falling apart, but the people, uh, we're stronger than we've ever been uh, in the places where we should have been this entire time, which has been with our people in our neighborhoods and in our community leading the way. Uh, to speak against some of these things that are being highlighted because of this pandemic. Uh, so I, I, I think that uh, for us, uh, the great opportunity to, to engage and to do ministry in new ways is where we're at and it's what we'll continue to do. Let us pray. Almighty God, pour upon Bryant Xavier Phelps the Holy Spirit for the office and work of an elder in Christ's holy church. Amen. Bryant Xavier Phelps take authority as an elder to preach the word of God, to administer the holy sacraments, and to order the life of the church in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
I love that the United Methodist Church allows us to bring our whole selves into the space of worship. Um, not just who we are, but what we think, what we dream, what we believe. It allows us to be our full selves. That was something that I didn't grow up with. To, uh, with the church foundation that I grew up in, they asked me to be something that I really wasn't. And it felt like I had to be somebody else if I was gonna be a follower of Jesus. I hope that we can remember who we are and that we can remember that we are a diverse people, that we're a people who uses all of ourselves uh, when things come up uh, that maybe want to cause division. We remember that it's not just our brains that worship God, but it's our hearts, it's our bodies, it's our soul. And so just, I'm really hoping that in the future of the United Methodist Church, we can be soul-filled people. People that seek God with the deepest parts of ourselves and not just maybe what we think. But there's this idea of, of completely um, innovating what we do next in ministry from, from top to bottom. How can we reach people where they're at, where they're congregating, um, where their children are, where they're spending their hours after work? Uh, can we be church there? Can we bring a gospel message, a message of hope? Because I know right now that's what all of my neighbors need to know that they're okay. They need to know that there is still light and hope in the world and we have the opportunity to be the church right where they are at. And so how can we do that in a completely new way? And I'm excited to think about recreating church um, from the bottom up. Let us pray. Almighty God, pour upon Ashley and Scythe the Holy Spirit for the office and work of an elder in Christ's holy church. Amen. Ashley and Sipe, take authority as an elder to preach the word of God, to administer the holy sacraments, and to order the life of the church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I love the theology of grace that John Wesley has taught us and um, I love thinking about Methodism in that it welcomes all people and the United Methodist Church is one that has offered me a place to understand God more of a as more of a loving God and not as a judgmental God my hope is that the United Methodist Church will continue to be strong and that it will continue to be a place of refuge and safety and love for all people. I know that we do not all agree on uh, a number of issues and how we live, but I hope that we could love each other more and more and more by the grace of God. I, I hope and pray that United Methodist Church will remain and grow to be strong because I myself have encountered churches where God's love is not as evident. In fact, I have felt judged by churches I have attended in the past. And, and so I, I think what the United Methodist offers currently, and we continue to offer, is a place of refuge and safety, welcoming and acceptance. And I pray that we'll continue to grow by God's grace. And so I would say that uh, it's been a challenge for everyone, but I'm really thankful that my church has adapted so well, so wonderfully to the challenges that we had before us. We made decisions together, and we decided to launch a new Facebook Live worship service that is uh, concurrent with in-person worship that is socially distanced currently. So I don't know what the rest of the year will hold for us for next year, but I am very excited that Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and God our Father is leading all of us together on this, on this wonderful journey that is at times challenging and scary, but yet wonderfully new and refreshing. Let us pray. Almighty God, pour upon Sylvia Shihan Wang the Holy Spirit for the office and work of an elder in Christ's holy church. 
Amen. Sylvia Sheehan Wang, take authority as an elder to preach the word of God, to administer the holy sacraments, and to order the life of the church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you return to the? Will you turn turn to the congregation? Remove your mask so we can actually see who we ordained this evening. Will you greet these new elders in the United Methodist Church? Let us continue to worship. You may be seated.
Let us pray together. We thank you, gracious God, for raising up among us faithful servants. Clothe them with your righteousness and grant that we with them may glorify you by giving ourselves to others. Amen. In a moment, I'll pronounce the benediction. I will ask you to remain in your seats. I believe you're going to be dismissed pew by pew or at point, but at least uh, remain through the singing of the recessional hymn. I believe the ushers will guide you that way. Uh, will you stand and receive this benediction? And so these are words I speak often in churches across North Texas. Bear witness to the love of God in this world so that the stranger you meet may find in you a generous friend. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of our God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest and be with you now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you.